Please join me in a pledge to the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the September 11th, 2017 Board of Selectmen's meeting. I will start with public comment period. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak this evening? Skip Webb. I prefer to ask to speak with the water company when you're discussing their problems. Uh, as a representative of the uh, Aquarian Waterworks Advisory Committee, uh, it had other committee names and the other other uh, company names in the front of it. But I have been on the Waterworks Advisory Committee for 17 and a half years, representing the town of Hampton. Okay, any objections to that? Fine. Fine. Thank you. That's good. Anybody else in the public wishing to speak, please? Cool. I'm Patricia Murphy. I uh, live at Fort Haverhill. Um, and I was here two weeks ago requesting some measure of transparency with regard to the noise ordinance, the potential for a committee to review the same uh, for a warrant article next year. Um, and notwithstanding that, um, if I hadn't called last Thursday to find out whether anything was coming up about that today, there's no way I could have known. On the uh, <coughs> Town of Hampton uh, Board of Selectmen agenda, I note uh, Roman numeral four, subparagraph five, an individual by the name of Brian Provencal uh, to discuss the petition 2012 warrant article 35. I don't know how that gives anybody notice of anything. Googled it, couldn't figure out what, what 2012 Warren Article 35 was, and if I hadn't called, I wouldn't know. So I'd request in the future that if something is coming up with regard to the entertainment licenses or Warren Articles over the committee or anything like that, that there be some descriptor in the published agenda so that individuals who are interested could be here. Um, I'd also uh, re renew my request uh, that uh, that there be some notice or some decision made about whether a committee is going to be formed and to notify the public of that sufficiently in advance of any hearing on that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the public wishing to be heard? Seeing none, we'll go to announcements and community calendar. We'll start. Virginia, do you have anything? I just want to say that we, I believe all just at the uh, post-35 legions on 9-11 remembrance, and it was a uh, very uh, touching touching hour that we had down there, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank the legion for that. Awesome. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, and uh, um, the public uh, uh, comment period just alluded to uh, uh, right to know. I'd, I'd like to thank you as we uh, head into the last quarter in the final run uh, for your leadership as, as chair. Uh, you've done a magnificent job, and as we proceed this evening, uh, and as we get into the uh, the last run of the uh, the year, um, 2017, the governor was in town tonight and tonight and spoke uh, on this summer evening um, in uh, memorial to those that uh, suffered from those uh, in this world that would try and change government by uh, terror and uh, the taking of life and destruction of property. And uh, he had some very salient and, and important remarks to make about how well New Hampshire uh, does business and how well uh, this town does business. The citizens, the business owners, they'll be in tonight. We've got myriad issues. Uh, and it all comes down to the rule of law. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, again, under your esteemed leadership this year, uh, the duties of the town officers under Chapter 41, which guides all of us under the rule of law, is that the New Hampshire selectmen shall manage the prudential affairs of the town and perform the duties by law prescribed. And as we enter into tonight, we've got uh, an excellent uh, uh, executive staff led under Mr. Welch, uh, 
uh, his uh, assistant town manager, finance, public works, fire, um, town council, et cetera, right on down the line. And it's, it's been magnificent. Tonight, we will see the importance of uh, the town approving and finance director uh, implementing GASB 45. And we'll be using that for data with uh, some pursuits with the state. Uh, our town esquire has done a magnificent job. And specifically, and just briefly, Mr. Chairman, under uh, the state constitution and the rule of law. And I will say under Article 8, uh, accountability and magistrates and officers, the public's right to know. There will be a uh, attempt by some in the Seacoast to hold hearings uh, in private, the Coakley Landfill Group, uh, and Mr. Welch, through your leadership, Mr. Uh, um, Waddell, uh, will, has a motion prepared tonight. And uh, Article 8 reads, all power residing originally in and being derived from the people, all magistrates and officers of government, are their substitutes and agents, and at all times accountable to them. Government, therefore, should be open, accessible, accountable, and responsive. To that end, the public's right of access to governmental proceedings and records shall not be unreasonably restricted. That dates uh, 2 June 1784. That is the state of New Hampshire Constitution. There will be a motion uh, put forth by Mr. Welch and the town council later on this evening. Going forward, uh, furthermore, finally, Mr. Chairman, uh, the state indemnification on, on state beaches. Uh, we have uh, something uh, very professionally prepared by our uh, finance director, again under Mr. Welch's directed, Article 28A, 28 November 1984 state constitution, state law, which we all ascribe to. The state shall not mandate or assign any new expended or modified programs or responsibilities to any political subdivision in such a way as to necessitate additional local expenditures by the political subdivision unless such programs or responsibilities are fully funded by the state or unless such programs or responsibilities are approved for funding by a vote of the local legislative body of the political subdivision. Discussion tonight under those indemnification uh, uh, agreements that do not exist, <clears throat> that are hundreds of thousands of dollars. Again, another motion prepared. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Griffin. I, I would just like to say that it was very, um, you know, it, listening to uh, Mrs. Natalie Healy, that was the um, Seal's mother, um, Daniel Healy, uh, was very inspiring and it was nice to see someone like her speak from her heart like she did. It was beautiful. And I'd like to also uh, congratulate John Nyan for doing such a great job with the Seafood Festival. From everything I've heard, things went great and uh, I know John worked hard on it. I'd like to just ditto the uh September 11th ceremony over at Post 35. If people have never gone to that, they re they hold it every September 11th, no matter what, no matter what the weather is, and they honor all those who have fallen during the war on terror. And I, it, I would just encourage everybody next year to go and be at that ceremony. It's very moving and it's, it's very well done. Also, I'd like to uh, Congratulate the Chamber and John Nyan and all the volunteers that were at the Seafood Festival and the uh, Board of Selectmen here in town were in charge of the weather and we provided beautiful weather all weekend. <laughs> all right, consent agenda. Release of welfare lien map 155 lot 41, request of town clerk to increase part-time employee hours to 29.5 hours, appointment Representative Edgar to the Seacoast Commission on Long-Term Goals and Requirements for Drinking Water. Um, so moved. Okay, so moved. Second? Okay. Just very quickly, the, the request by the town clerk. It's the result of the extra long lines that we've been suffering. Uh, it, she has employees who cannot work more. We have employees who are part-time who cannot work more than 30 hours a week because of restrictions put on by the state. We'd have to give them full-time benefits of health and so on and so forth. So uh, we're, she's requesting that we work them 29.5 hours, which is in, over the increase of the 28 that the board had previously authorized. Good. I just thought that would be good for the public. Uh, all in favor? Unanimous. Passes. Appointments. Chief Ayotte and Deputy Chief Kennedy, Fire Department. One departmental update. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. 
As it is a later hour, I appreciate that, and if you would like, I will certainly uh, present to you in the manner with which I, in the speed with which I usually speak. So maybe what that means. <laughs> This is our quarterly report, and good evening, Mr. Chairman, and to the board. Thank you very much for allowing us this opportunity to speak with you this evening. It seems only a few minutes ago that we were preparing for the 4th of July in the summer season, and now it's in the rearview mirror. We've been working diligently throughout the summer. Shortly after our last visit, we saw 12 of our firefighters go through rescue swimmer and rescue boat operator training. Uh, this class took place from June 5th through the 9th, and this was the first time all of our newest members were instructed in this type of work. They took part in water entry, swimming techniques, and rescue techniques, which included lifting patients out of the water while keeping themselves afloat. They performed rescues in the open water of the Atlantic and also learned the proper way to get on and off the rocks and heavy surf. They were instructed in proper boat handling and using Marine One as a rescue platform. We have completed the work in the front of the fire station headquarters. Jamco was hired in to remove the stumps and concrete wall, as well as bring in 10 truckloads of earth from the DPW. The area was hydro seeded and has been growing exceptionally well. Attached to the quarterly report, you'll find the fire incident analysis, <coughs> which provides a breakdown for the calls uh, the, the Hampton Fire Rescue has been performing. Additionally, we've included a snapshot of the summer season defined as the Friday before Memorial Day through Labor Day. We answered a total of 3,132 calls for service through Labor Day. That breaks down to 1,540 calls for fire, 1,592 calls for, uh, for patient contacts. Um, I did provide you with a five-year comparison. Um, for the fire side, we continue to be busy with a wide range of calls. We've responded to a total of 15 structure fires in town. In late June, we responded to Fuller Acres following an outside fire that a resident had started using a small amount of gasoline. No injuries resulted and the damage was minor, but as a public service announcement, do not use gasoline to start any type of fire. On July 18th, 2017, Hampton Engine 1, Ladder 1, EMS Officer C1 and C2 all responded as mutual aid for a structure fire in Northampton. Unfortunately, this fire resulted in a fatality. Our crews worked diligently to rescue the occupant and provided CPR and advanced life support from the scene to the Portsmouth Hospital, but they were unable to revive the resident. In the very small hours of August 20th, Engine 4 and C1 responded mutual aid for a structure fire at Brown's Restaurant in Seabrook. The crews worked to extinguish the fire that was concentrated to the kitchen. And on September 2nd, we responded to a fire here in Hampton, located at 725 Lafayette Road, behind Seacoast Coin and Jewelry. The crews arrived approximately four minutes after the initial call was placed and made quick work of the fire. Four units were impacted by smoke, but the fire is contained to the coin shop. In the emergency medical services world, we had 1,592 patient contacts since the beginning of the year. This translates to a decrease of about 9% from 2016 for the same time period, but this number has changed as we have had a significant call volume over the weekend, with another 26 ambulance calls and 15 more for fire. Of these calls for service, 33 were for overdose. Hampton Fire Rescue has administered Narcan a total of 46 times, which is an increase of 12% over last year. Opiates continue to plague all communities. As you may have seen, the state laboratory has identified that against our hopes, carfentanil has made its way into the Granite State. And as of July 10th, there were 10 fatalities that have been attributed to this drug. We've been collaboratively working with the Hampton Police Department to bring about education and training for the deployment of the EMS in the warm zone equipment. The Body Armor Outlet, our supplier, sent a representative to the station to educate all members on the level of protection that the vest will provide. Now we are coordinating with, uh, for a combined training exercise bet between police and fire to exercise in real time wearing the gear. An additional note on our choice of hospitals. I had updated you on the Seabrook ER. Currently, we, we see that um, for the Exeter Hospital, we are providing patients there 48% of the time, 30% of the time to the Portsmouth Regional, and now 20% of the time to the Seabrook ER in the last three months. Our crews have worked some very difficult incidents this summer. Several providers were exposed to hepatitis C while working on a patient and are being monitored which means that serial blood work analyses must be performed. We remain vigilant for their health and well-being following this time of tr type of trauma. Looking at the summer season as described above, a 103-day period, Hampton Fire Rescue responded to a total of 1,511 calls. We fielded 739 calls for fire. In an EMS, we saw a total of 772 patient contacts. This translates to approximately 14.7 calls per day. Some days were what we would consider normal. Routine calls that come in spaced apart throughout the entire 24-hour time period. Simultaneous calls occur quite frequently, with one or two calls coming in around the same time. More than one or two can tax the system. This occurred on August 22nd when we fielded seven calls for service in a matter of four hours. 
Almost half of the daily average of call volume occurred in four hours. We required mutual aid ambulance from Northampton for one call, but we were fortunate to have callback help from our own staff. These were serious calls, with one being a cardiac arrest that occurred on the beach, two calls for stroke, a fall from a roof, two sinkable episodes, and a call for a dehydrated patient. Trauma calls, such as the fall from the roof, are very labor-intensive. Cardiac arrest calls are also very labor-intensive. Three or more members are needed to complete the call in the patient compartment. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, requires a minimum of two providers to switch out every two minutes to provide the most efficient patient care with the best response. Scientific data supports this, and this is the best practice. However, this requires a large portion of our on-duty personnel to be dedicated to one call. The three in the back, and one needs to drive the ambulance to the hospital. This particular call requires several New Hampshire State lifeguards who did a tremendous job of providing CPR in the AED and transportation from the beach. An ambulance company, an engine company, the EMS officer, and myself, and HPD as well. Despite our best efforts, the patient's outcome was not what we had hoped. Fire prevention. The Fire Prevention Bureau has performed 182 inspections, issued 114 permits, and collected $4,761.90 in fees. The table that I provided shows a comparison three years running. There have been 15 display firework inspections in 2017, and only the New Year's Eve shoot remains. We continue to see a great response from the hotels and motels corresponding with the initiative to perform life safety inspections once a year. This complies with state law and also ensures that our businesses provide the safest experience for all of Hampton's visitors. The Seafood Fest preparations took place in the week prior to the Labor Day holiday, and the plans review and tent installation and the inspection for the permits of assembly all took place in the days and weeks prior to the setup. Fire prevention performed daily inspections of the tents and vendors during the Seafood Fest. For communications, Hampton Fire Alarm has answered a total of 11,796 phone calls through Labor Day. This translates to an average of 47 calls per day. During the 4th of July, Fire Alarm answered 427 phone calls compared to 119 on Labor Day. In administration, we have received the reserve engine that the town purchased from Warminster, Pennsylvania. It's currently having some minor mechanical repairs performed that have been previously identified and the pump will be serviced as well. Uh, tomorrow, we are seeing radio installation. She will be sent to be lettered in the next few weeks. We hope to see her in service by early October and uh, following uh, all group level training on the operations of the new pump. We're working on the replacement of Ambulance 3, which is a 2009 model with 97,615 miles. We have received an offer to purchase the 2002 HME Smeal Engine 2 as is by a call fire department in Hampton, New York. We will be discussing that following this report, and I highly recommend accepting this offer for purchase. Thank you for your consideration. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Regina. Um, thank you, Chief. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Thanks for everything you did this year, especially I saw you guys down there all weekend this weekend. Great job keeping everything safe down there with the help of the police department. I did have one question just because people, they brought it up to me about a year ago, and I know you actually addressed it, but I had a conversation with you the other day. I thought maybe you could reiterate that a little bit as to what it would take. People are concerned how we no longer have an ambulance full-time down the beach. And I know that's a staffing level, so I thought maybe if you could explain it tonight so that people could hear it. Sure. So in brief, I want to be sure that people understand that we are getting them the okay. most capable Definitely. help possible immediately. Um, currently, the staffing mechanism as we have it, there are three people down at the beach fire station. One is an officer or lieutenant, and then two firefighters. And of those two firefighters, one is a paramedic. They will respond to that area so that the paramedic is able to provide care initially, and they have all the, all the equipment that we would have on the ambulance. The ambulance will respond to that area of the beach uh, and transport the patient. They're already receiving the care. The ambulance is arriving to do the rest of the work, which is transport to the hospital. Here in town, uh, any other paramedics that are working will be uh, at headquarters, and they'll be able to respond. If need be, if there is ever a second call where a paramedic is required, they'll come from the beach and go perform that call. We do call back right now, so if the ambulance transports out of town, we call in two, and they will come from home. So there's a delay, as far as that goes, getting people back. Uh, as I stated on that particular call um, in in August, we did have callback staff, and there were there were people in here to work, so that was good. In order to provide uh, an full-time ambulance coverage all the time in the beach, we need to have it staffed appropriately. Uh, we've discussed the fact that we currently now, and, and you can see it in the books, we have nine people per day, except we do something called running down. In running down, if somebody takes vacation or is ill uh, or injured, whether it's on the job or off, then they're not covered. So we will run down to eight personnel per day. The ninth person right now is currently operating uh, as a driver of the ladder truck. 
um, the two ambulance personnel will cross staff the ladder truck. So in essence, at headquarters, we have an engine with three, which is a captain and two firefighters, the ladder with three on a nine-person day, and down at the beach we have um, three, the lieutenant and two firefighters. In order to provide full-time ambulance down there, we would need a total of ten. We would need to maintain the ninth all the time and then have a tenth all the time. What that would do is give us three on the engine up here as the firefighting force, two on the ambulance, which would cross-staff the ladder, three on the engine down at the beach, and two on the ambulance at, at the uh, beach station. They would still function during a fire. They would be the rescue company. They would correspond and, and, um, and work with the ladder company. But in order to do that appropriately, that would take a total complement of 10 all the time. So we need two additional we, it, Well, we need to first, if we're going to do that, we need to staff to nine all the time, and then it would take a total of four. We have four groups that work um, on a rotating basis. So of those four groups, each one would require a new firefighter. Okay. Okay. Thank you for Thank explaining. You. Absolutely. Proceed. No, nope, good report. And uh, as Regina said, these two gentlemen, along with uh, Inspector Payne, were down at the beach all weekend and uh, doing an excellent job. They had the first aid station up at the up at the tent up there with the EMS officer and a couple of firefighters, and I think that works out really well. <coughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bean? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great job, gentlemen. Thank you. I have no questions. Thank you. Superintendent? Yep. Thank you for your report. Thank you. Appreciate Good report. Thanks, sir. Uh, great visibility down at the beach. Thank uh, you. The, um, station where you were was very good. I only have one complaint. I asked the deputy to declare me too ill to volunteer anymore, and he wouldn't do it. That's a little complaint there. I hope I'm wrong. I hope, I hope I'm wrong on this. Uh, as of July 10th, 10 fatalities. That's true. Is that in Hampton or no, statewide? That's statewide. Statewide, okay. However, as you might imagine, the state is, uh, they have one lab, and that lab is working diligently but not, um, they're not putting any type of hierarchy on the calls that come in. They're coming in first come, first serve basis. There are currently 20 more calls that they have unidentified substances. And as of the posting from August from the state, uh, there are potentially 20 more fatalities that can be attributed to this drug. They, they don't have a definitive yet. They're waiting on toxicological analysis. Wow, that was a big word. That wasn't yeah. good. So um, they're waiting for that. So when toxicology comes back, they might update that data, and we'll know then. Great. Good. Uh, anybody else? Anything else? No? Okay. Can we move on to the sale of the 2002? I would love to. So uh, the, the story behind this is Lieutenant Burlard was out in the front of the beach fire station and was approached by a gentleman who said, hey, I'd like to buy a fire engine. And he was pointing at engine four. And Lieutenant Brillard was very fast talking. He says, ah, I can't sell it. It's brand new. But I would like to sell you that one. And he pointed to engine two, the smeal. And uh, the gentleman said, well, what's it got? And so he started talking about it, and he became very interested indeed, and he submitted his name. And so we did a little bit of research, and the deputies called him a couple of times. Uh, he has talked it over with his board, which is, uh, they're a call uh, volunteer fire department in Hampton, New York. Um, they do, they are aware of the situation with the frame, and they placed an offer, as is understood, that this would be no warranty from us to purchase uh, the 2002 HME Smeal, known as Engine 2, for $5,000. I would recommend this. As you might recall, Engine 4, the 1988, um, went for $301? Yeah, $301. So this seems like it would be a uh, fabulous deal. Questions? No questions. No, I think, uh, I, th I think it's a good point to get rid of it. Speed? Negative, sir. Thank you. So they're buying as is. They are. They have no liability. That. Right. They take it out. They're on. I have a paper already for them to sign this state okay. such. And uh, they also understand that if you give the blessing tonight, they'll be on their way tomorrow. Is Morning. Right? They're waiting for my phone call when they leave this office. Nice. I'll make, like the motion. <laughs> I'll make the motion that we uh, allow the fire department to dispose of the surplus property. Second. Okay. All in favor? Unanimous? Wonderful. The third item that I come before you for is a re request for relief from the uh, purchasing policy and a waiver of section 718-9, 718-16 nine, uh, through sole source purchasing. We are looking to purchase another Zoll monitor. You remember that I came before you two years ago in February of 2015 and we purchased four Zoll monitors, cardiac monitors, to replace the, um, the outdated models that we had on the ambulances. And in order to provide the best care, we also placed one on engine four. At the time, this was a deal. We bought four, and because of the sale price, we were able to get them at $25,000 a piece. 
Um, Mr. Walsh helped us and we were able to uh, divert the payments over a course of 10 months for which we made $100,000. Um, we purchased four of them. They've been serviced. They continue to be our frontline pieces. However, because of the call volume and what we're actually doing, Engine 1 is also responding to these calls and they're using uh, an AED that I don't even think we can find the date on to be perfectly honest. It's somewhere around 2000. Uh, we're looking to, to give them and supply them with the proper equipment to do the job and to that end it'll be the exact same equipment that we have on all the ambulances. So we're looking to buy another Zoll X-Series monitor. The cost on this one, it's going to be a refurbished model, um, $23,000, and it will come from the EMS account. It will also be uh, given to us with a six-month warranty. <coughs> so I feel that this is an excellent purchase. So these are the same the same, uh, same company that you already deal with, so you're apples to apples. That's correct. So you're not, you're not mixing up and changing things around they're all the same or if we do it's the same everybody they're using the exact same equipment it's actually going to be come we already know that it's outfitted um, with all the same bells and whistles right. mr chairman i uh, would move that we uh, grant the waiver from the section 718-9718-6 sole source of the purchasing policy and uh, authorize the chief to purchase the zoll medical x-series monitor defib at twenty three thousand five hundred dollars all in favor Thank you That's very much. All I have. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you, gentlemen. Second is for appointments are Chris Jacobs, Director, and Jen Hale, the Deputy Director, DPW, Green Street Flooding Corrective Action Contract. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Fine. So we've been busy putting together paperwork for you, and we're trying to clear up tonight. Um, the first item is uh, the Green Street Flooding uh, Corrective Action Plan. Um, we were last before you August 21 with the uh, direction to continue to negotiate with Swamp Inc. for a plan um, to um, basically do a dredge out behind Green Street to permit the water from this neighborhood to enter into Meadow Pond and then continue on out to Eel Creek and then hopefully out to sea. Um, several days later, I did get a proposal from them before I think I... Uh, it was a range proposal between 45 and 75. We don't like range proposals. Um, so they gave us a firmer proposal, a firmer scope of work at 44,730. Um, we have discussed uh, with Evan Lewis at the New Hampshire Wetlands Bureau, uh, working with this contractor under a um, emergency dredge and fill so that we could get the work done this fall. Um, as you, you may or may not know for the public's benefit, when you request an emergency permit, you really have to define what you're going to do, scope of work, et cetera. They actually issue you a permit to do it, and then you have to follow up afterwards with all the, the backup information. So um, that is why it is a one particular contractor. They have faith in uh, Swamp Inc. to be able to perform the work. Questions? You know? uh, so this is the firm number 44730? Four, yes, 44730. Thank you. I don't have any questions. All set. Mr. Page? Uh, prepared to move, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Griffin? Uh, I just have a, one question. When the company's working in the wetlands, if there's any disruption or anything that goes incorrectly or something, who's got the liability? The they town do. or the company? They do. They do. They, they, they're responsible to the New Hampshire Wetlands Bureau to follow their rules. They have specialized equipment. Um, it's actually some of it is detailed out in their, uh, in their proposal. For instance, uh, state law requires that low ground pressure equipment be used in salt mar marshes and the equipment that they have, a wetlands excavator, uh, less than 4 PSI. Um, they've got it at 2.5. 5.8 pounds per square inch. Uh, same thing on their skid steer and the dump carrier, which they're going to use to haul the material out, are all less than that. I think the the waste or the spoils material that they'll haul out will eventually come over to um, public works, where it's going to have to stay for a period of time to dry out, and then um, we can more properly dispose of it. But that's part of their contract, also. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would move that in accordance with the 31 August 2017 uh, memo to Mr. Welch uh, and to Director Pulliam 
that Mr. Jacobs be authorized to expend $44,730 uh, to uh, hire Swamp Bank to execute the contract to dredge marsh behind Green and Gentian for $44,730. Second. Second by Rusty. All in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Unanimous. Moving on to the next. Next thing. Salt bid 2017-2018 winter season. Yes. Um, for everyone's benefit, uh, we go through this every fall. Um, the state actually bids out um, salt prices or salt uh, per ton delivered to various regions of the state. Um, in the past, we have tacked on to whoever their low bidder is. In this particular case, it is Granite State Materials, which is the same firm that we used last year. Uh, this year's price is 53.30 per ton delivered to our yard. Uh, the price last year was 51.73. Um, I've given you a copy of the um, their, if you will, letter saying that we want to tack on to the to the bid. I just would need your authority to do so. And this is a state bid, so it's statewide, right? There was two. There was Morton Salt, and there was this Granite State Minerals. And I believe when Morton saw what. Um, Granite State did. They also sent us a letter, same price, but we'd like to stay with the same vendor. Um, I have no questions. Nope. Griffin? Mr. Bean? Negative, sir. I'll make the motion to accept the bid from Granite State. Okay. I'll second. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous? All right. Next, a request to open pavement of Toll Farm Road, NH School of Mechanical Trades. Correct. Uh, currently before the um, plan review committee and, and I believe coming before the planning board any day now? Uh, beginning of October. Okay. Uh, is a new school um, that wants to move into town known as the New Hampshire School of Mechanical Trades. Uh, one issue that they have is that the water line that they want to tie into for fire protection and, and drinking water services is on the opposite side and we resurfaced Toll Farm Road a year ago. Um, in the past, what we've made people do when they do resurf, do this type of work is actually come back in and heat the pavement up, do a much better job, if you will, of uh, the final patch. And um, this is something we have done and have allowed <coughs> in the past. I would recommend it. Virginia? Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be a great addition for the town, so yep. I have no problem. Thanks, Griffin. Bean? Yeah, in uh, 20 words or less, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Director. Ordinance 769-5, parentheses, alpha. 20 words or less. That is the actual process they would use to uh, repair the road. It's actually laid out by ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'll um, make the motion. Oh, go, go ahead. I was going to make a motion to uh, allow. Yeah, I just, I, I, I sat in on that presentation with that group when they first came here and it really positive for the town it would be a great addition uh, for that type of industry the, this is just this is all depending upon whether it's accepted by the planning board and everything correct right so i have to get planning board approval yep okay so i'll make a motion that we really, uh, give them a permit to open the pavement on toll farm road and repair it as per the requirements of the public works second all in favor opposed unanimous Next. Next. Bid 2015-030, Mill Pond Restoration Addendum Number 1. Yes. Um, we went through a process of uh, RFQ um, for uh, finding an engineer to design uh, the restoration plan for the Mill Pond Dam um, way back in January 14, uh, 2016. Um, in June of 16, June 20 of 16, we entered contract with them. They are come forward with an addendum one, uh, unforeseen work. This has to do more with the, uh, that is a historical site. The land around it is a historical site. Part of this addendum one is for, uh, is a request of from the New Hampshire Historical Society is to do exploratory pits that they hand dig looking for um, early use artifacts, i.e. Um, 
for people that use that as a mill site, but also if it was potentially used uh, by the Indians and or uh, what was the other term that they used? Uh, pre. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, real early. Uh, I'll put it that way. So um, there, there's an archaeological phase that needs to be done with this. There's also a, uh, additional work under the Section 106 of the U.S. Army Corps uh, process. So this, um, we support this uh, addendum. That's something we've had much discussion with with uh, Par Corporation but it's what we need to do to complete the permitting on this particular project for it to go forward to even be bid out. Discussion? No. Discussion over yes, here? Yes, sir, I do have a question. Okay. Um, uh, concerned about the mushroom factor on this, uh, Director. Yes. Uh, it says service is not included, uh, mitigation, blah, 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 construction, post-construction monitoring. Uh, I understand the intent and the spirit of that. Did, did you discuss with the uh, contractor uh, that mushroom factor to, to be uh, generic? Yeah, that is generic because, to be honest with the construction and post-construction monitoring and um, anything else that the feds may come up with or the, the state, is what they're saying is not included in this, but their whole scope of work is already, including construction services, has already been entered. So into. you see the $16,000 in changes in end state, and that it won't go past that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and this is the, the dam has been going on for how long? Almost two years now. Two years, yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion? I'll make the motion. Okay. The board of select. Of course, thank you. I was gonna. I, we have a possible motion here. The board of selectmen herewith accept addendum one from the Paré Corp for additional engineering, design, and permitting services in the amount of sixteen thousand six hundred dollars. This work is in addition to the previous contract signed June 20, two thousand sixteen. The funding for this work shall be from the approved warrant article thirty eight at the two thousand fifteen town meeting. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Do you have anything else for us? Jennifer does. Actually, the last item on here was the extension of work hours for Lafayette Road Sewer so Project. I'm going to ask that we just continue that to a, another point in time at this point as we're still working through some of the details while, while I'm sitting here. Um, <laughs> we are working with Brock's Paving. They were the ones that uh, the board awarded the 2017 fall paving contract for our roads here in Hampton. They have asked if uh, we would be uh, agree to give them permission to pave uh, three Saturdays. Um, it would be in addition to their weekly work, but so that they could schedule Friday, Saturday. Um, they're looking at September 23rd, September 30th, and October 7th. Not to always use all three, but to have the availability to use them. And your recommendation on that? Is to move forward with them. The roads that we're looking at are Drake side, uh, as we talked discussed before, Merrill Industrial Drive, Woodland Road. Um, the idea is to get them in and while they're here, have them complete all the work at once instead of having them leave and coming back. So if we can afford them that um, extra time to do so, it's to our benefit. I'll make that motion. Okay. Second. All in favor? Okay. Opposed? Okay, unanimous. Anything else? No. no. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is John Nye and Experience Hampton. Discussion of it on Experience Hampton's petitioned 2017 Warrant Article 44. Mr. Nyan and his posse. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and the uh, Board of Directors, uh, Board of Selectmen, I should say. Um, we're here tonight to honor our commitment uh, to the warrant Article 44 and the contribution from Experience Hampton of $30,000. <coughs> I'd like to have John Tinius actually uh, say a few words since he was the uh, author and strategist uh, behind our 2020 uh, strategy uh, within Experience Hampton. So, John. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. 2020, as you know, is approaching us. Um, not too far away. In 2020, my business is going to be 50 years old. Uh, what has happened in the last decade with the beach uh, renovation of the half shell 
the bathhouses uh, and accessory buildings, <coughs> along with the seawall restoration, has brought incredible development to that beach area. Anybody who lives down there knows it. Um, it continues to go on. It has increased the tax base. It has helped the community. We'll continue to pay dividends for a generation. The 2020 vision is something that isn't born out of this, you know, era. This has been something that we've all aspired to for a long, long time. Many studies have been done about the Route 1 corridor. Uh, I've been involved in a couple of them. Um, lots of great ideas. And now is the time to act. When you feel that the time is right, and we are doing a lot of construction to Route 1 right now, this is an opportunity that we'll only find in our generation. <coughs> to do it, to do it as inexpensively as possible, to do it with public and private support, to do it in a way that will make my parents proud, uh, because they always wanted to see this community do better for itself. Any time that somebody did something privately or publicly, they applauded that effort. Responsibility really lies within us. And this was born out of really a group of citizens that got together in a diverse group. There was um, town, town, uh, town workers, uh, firefighters, retired firefighter, now a selectman. Uh, three entrepreneurs in the private sector, a couple of realtors, somebody that's in insurance. These are all private people that got together and put their hard work and dedication, not only to the 2020 effort, uh, but to making Hampton a better place to be as a citizen and as a visitor, to restoring the Christmas parade, to bringing other events to the town, uh, to make in Hampton the special place that it is. And the people of Hampton are special people. A lot of community involvement in this town. A lot of, a lot of communities would, would love to have the community involvement that we have in Hampton. So we put our money really where our efforts have gone as a plan, as a plan to make Hampton user-friendly, community accessible, <clears throat> place where you'd be proud to go and shop, recreate, and have the ability uh, to grow the community. And a lot of developers that I know have expressed interest that this could be something that really starts a, re uh, a you know, rejuvenation of the area. So I ask you for your support. You've given it to us in the past. We understand that, the, that this is ambitious, but we also feel that we have the skill set and definitely the, I would say, enthusiasm and passion to make this a successful project. I've seen a lot of things come and go here some that should have stuck and some that deserve to go. This is one that should stick. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. So with that, I, I also have some board members here uh, representing Experience Hampton, Bob Preston, Diana Martin, John, as you heard, Kristen Russell, Dean Merrill, and Rusty Bridal. So on behalf of our group, I would like to present the uh, check uh, for thirty thousand dollars to the uh, chairman, and um, ask that uh, and hope uh, that as of tomorrow we will be able to move forward um, with the work that's being discussed right now between the town of Hampton and Unitil. Always glad to accept money. 
<laughs> make the motion to accept so it's oh, stop. Make I'll a make a motion that we accept make the, motion. the uh, <laughs> town accepts the money from Experience Hampton. Second. All in favor. Now we'll accept the money. I'll abstain. <laughs> Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Right, 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 right over to the town manager. Oh, Jim. no, 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 no. Jim, I abstained. Just okay, for... yeah, okay. Uh, four in favor, one abstention. Um, a discussion on this from the board. Questions? No, did, I don't have any questions right Rusty? now. Rusty? Oh, you're I abstained. Ms. Griffin? Mr. Bean? Negative, sir. Okay, I just hope now this was part of the Warren article. That's correct. And part yeah. of the Warren article was that you had to raise thirty five thousand dollars. Thirty thousand. You've raised that. Yes. You've given it to the town. Yes. The rest of the Warren article was that the money would be spent on going further with this uh, endeavor. That's correct. So now the hope is that we start in tomorrow and we can continue and push forward <clears throat> and get something done. That's correct. That's the understanding. That's the understanding of us, and we appreciate all you've done, uh, Experience Hampton. I mean that that alleyway that you made from the parking that was a public private and that was beautiful done and i think it's a great idea thank you very much thank, thank you very, very much. much for coming and the contracts will be signed tomorrow contracts will be signed tomorrow right okay Good. thank you thank you, thank you. next on the agenda is john hurley 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 Aquarian's Vice President of Water Quality, Environmental Management, and Government Relations, and Carl McMorrin. Uh, and Associates. And Associates, very good. We do have a presentation. Uh, I think they need the PowerPoint. Uh -oh. yeah. we, got, we, got our, we got our guys out back there. Let's see if we can get them to do it. Thank you. Can you do it? The, the Army's coming. The Marines have landed. ready here I just like to make a statement for all the people and the people watching on TV that the Board of Selectmen and the town manager the town council have been very aggressive on making sure that the citizens of Hampton have safe clean water and also that the Aquarian people have had meetings with the town and they've been very transparent and they also have the same goal in mind to provide safe clean water and they've been very good at answering any questions that we've had and working with the two selectmen who have spearheaded this mrs miss barnes and mr uh Bean, and with the town manager and the town council so i think this is a great effort and i think we're going forward with it so with that and if you have your powerpoint working Oh, yeah. There we go. I'll make, make one request that when you're t talking that you don't use initials, that if you use initials you explain what it is because a lot of times when people are watching something on TV, you know, you're rattling off a lot of stuff and it's like, whoa, what, what are they talking about? So just if you have an initial, tell us what it is. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Chairman Waddell and members of the board. My name is John Walsh. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Aquarion. Uh, and with me here tonight is Carl McMorrin, our Manager of Operations in New Hampshire. I think many of you know Carl. Uh, Dan Lawrence, who's behind me, he is our Director of Engineering and Planning. And John Hurley, he, uh, who's going to do most of the presentation, he's our Vice President of Water, Water Quality and Environmental Management. Uh, so tonight we'll be presenting information about PFCs in the groundwater and in the drinking water. Uh, and we'll also be presenting our multifaceted approach to addressing this emerging issue. Uh, before I hand it over to John, I just want to express uh, that we are as uh, concerned as you and our customers about PFCs in the groundwater and in the drinking water. Uh, providing high quality water is our highest priority 
we take our job very seriously. Uh, so uh, on this issue, we are committed to understanding the extent of uh, the PFC uh, uh, concentrations in the groundwater, the sources of those PFCs, and also the risks to all of our wells. We're committed to sharing all of that information readily with our customers and public officials um, like yourselves, and we're committed <coughs> to addressing uh, the concerns of our customers and public officials, uh, the concerns that you have about PFCs. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, John Hurley. Thank you. Yeah, I just, John, would you explain what a PFC yeah. is, please? <laughs> Throw up the rules right away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much to the board for allowing us the time to present, and thanks to the public for coming out. So uh, what we're going to cover tonight is a discussion of how our system works, where the water comes from, what are PFCs, as the chairman has asked. Uh, talk a little bit about the levels of PFCs that we've found through our testing, both in the drinking water that the customers receive, but also in the wells in the ground. In some cases, it's different. And then what, uh, what actions we are taking to address the PFCs that we have found. Okay, so this is uh, what we call our Hampton system. We supply customers in Hampton, North Hampton, and Rye. Uh, we have 14 wells. We have a well field up here on Winnicott Road that has seven wells. Those seven wells uh, blend inside the treatment plant. Their uh, treatment, disinfection treatment is applied, and then it goes out into the distribution pipes uh, at one point. Down here on Mill Road, there are six wells, but there is no uh, centralized disinfection treatment. So there are four different treatment facilities uh, that enter the Mill Road water main at four different locations. And then we have three wells that are uh, single source supply. So well 5A here in uh, Rye, and well 7 down here in Hampton, and well 14 in North Hampton. Also want to point out that our well 22, the well that we have uh, requested uh, to be able to add to our sources of supply is located down here in Hampton, uh, very close to well number seven. Okay, so PFCs, perfluorochemicals. Okay, so these are uh, a large group of chemicals. There are hundreds, I am told, hundreds of these uh, PFCs in existence, and they were developed because they have uh, properties to repel water, repel oil, and they're also heat resistant and chemical resistant. Uh, so they're used in clothing to uh, prevent staining. Uh, they're used in clothing and other materials uh, to repel water. Uh, they're also heat resistant, uh, so flame retardant clothing. Uh, also in fire suppression, firefighting foams, uh, and that type of thing. So, and they're used in products that uh, are found uh, in residences, also in commercial establishments, and in industrial applications. So they are widespread and they're ubiquitous in the environment. They're, they're, and being ubiquitous in the environment, they've been found in water, air, soil, house dust, and food. So there are different avenues of exposure to people, to PFCs. Water is one of them, uh, either by ingesting it or through the skin, air, in your respiratory system, uh, soil, and house dust. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, it's ingested, you can get it on your skin, and then food. Uh, and the reason that it's so ubiquitous is that it, it's found wherever the uh, PFCs have been manufactured, uh, stored, used, or disposed of. So you may have uh, PFCs in some of the products you use in your house, perhaps uh, cleaning products, and they may end up going down the drain. And that may end up in a septic system, may end up in a sewer system. And that's one of the avenues where it can get into groundwater is through a septic system. Another one would be a landfill, where all kinds of things have been disposed of, and then the uh, PFCs, along with other uh, chemicals, can leach uh, into the groundwater. Uh, so PFCs are considered an emerging contaminant. And what that means is that 
Uh, we weren't talking about PFCs 20 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, but within the last 10 years, EPA became aware that uh, these are compounds that they should be looking into to determine the toxicity and determine whether or not they should set an enforceable drinking water standard that public water suppliers would have to uh, comply with. We, we would have to make sure we're delivering water that has no more than X amount of PFCs in it. Uh, and that enforceable standard is called a maximum contaminant level. So currently, there are no enforceable standards, no maximum contaminant levels. But EPA had uh, public water providers test for six PFCs back in uh, 2014 and 2015. And based on those results, they set a preliminary standard called a health action level, health action limit, at, uh, for two of the six uh, PFCs that were tested at the time, uh, PFOA, which is perfluorooctanoic acid, and PFOS, which is perfluorooctane sulfonate. So they set a, a limit of 70 parts per trillion for each of those two compounds individually and the combination of the two. So if you test your water and you have uh, 40 parts per trillion of PFOA, you're in compliance with the PFOA limit, but if you have uh, 40 parts per trillion of PFOS, you're in compliance with the PFOS limit, but together they're 80 and you're exceeding the combined standard. So, uh, so those are, uh, that's a preliminary standard while they, while they continue to investigate the toxicity, how much PFC are people exposed to through drinking water compared to food and air and other uh, vectors. Uh, but in the meantime, they've set the standard at 70. And what they've indicated is they do not expect to have any adverse health effects at a level of 70 parts per trillion or less. The laboratories uh, test for PFCs at the part per trillion level. And so that's a very small amount. Most of the parameters that we test drinking water for are at the part per million or part per billion level. And a part per trillion is a million times lower than a part per million. Uh, so it's a very, very small level. Uh, the, the methods used to test for it are in their infancy. Uh, the detection limits for the, the uh, PFCs have decreased by uh, a factor of 10 in the four years that we've been testing for them. Uh, currently, most of the PFCs are, uh, have a detection limit on the order of one part per trillion to 10 parts per trillion. Currently, we are testing for 14 PFCs, whereas in 2014 and 15, it was only six. So the whole science uh, including the, the testing part, the, the health effects part, is at a very early stage and it's evolving. Uh, New Hampshire has also uh, set a limit for PFOA and PFOS and the com combination of the two also at 70 parts per trillion. Uh, New Jersey has set a, a preliminary standard at 40 parts per trillion just for uh, PFOA. And uh, Vermont has uh, set a standard of 20 uh, just for PFOA. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, what the PFC concentrations are that we have found in the drinking water. So I'm distinguishing uh, between what's in the drinking water, meaning the water that's in the distribution system that the customers receive as opposed to the water that's in the wells in the ground. Uh, and in some cases, that's very different, like with the mill road wells. Uh, so we did the, uh, the testing uh, that EPA required us to do in 2014 and 15. Uh, and then in 2016, we started testing on our own. So we were doing research. Uh, there were 96 different uh, tests performed in these two years, so uh, six PFCs times eight samples times two years. And we only got one detect. 
But because we had that one detect in well six, we decided uh, to do more testing because we knew that the um, detection limits had gotten lower and lower. And so we did the testing in 2016 and we found more. And then we did more testing in 2017 to follow up. The range of results for the most recent testing in 2017. So in 2017, we tested in June, and we tested uh, uh, in early August, uh, and we've also tested in late August, but we don't have the results back yet for the late August testing. It takes three weeks to get results back from the laboratory. So the first week of August results per PFOA and PFOS are in the range of two to seven parts per trillion, that's compared to that 70 part per trillion level of concern. And then if you take all the PFCs, so all 14 that the labs can currently test for, uh, the results are in the range of 3.9 to 15 parts per trillion. So this is a schematic of our uh, distribution system, and we have the Winnicott wells up here. So the purpose of this is to show you uh, the levels that we find in our distribution system. So currently we only have two distribution results, uh, but we're expanding that uh, in September. Uh, but where we have uh, the Winnicott wells, so all the wells are blended in the treatment plant and then they enter the distribution system at a level of two uh, in the first week of August. So you would expect that the customers in this area of the system uh, would be getting uh, two parts per trillion of the PFOA plus PFOS. And these are, you know, some of our primary mains here, but the point is that there's a lot of demand in the Mill Road area, there's demand in the summer in the uh, Hampton Beach area, and so the, the water goes to where the biggest demands are, and so there's blending that occurs along the way in the system. So the, the water from Winnicott, blends with the water from well 14, which has a seven parts per trillion number, and then it continues down towards the center uh, where the big demand is, and the mill road wells come into play. Uh, well seven is over here, and then up in Rye we have uh, well number 5A. But you can see that uh, these PFOA plus PFOS levels, the total for those two, are very low compared to the uh, EPA and NHDES standards. Here's uh, another way of uh, looking at those results in the drinking water. Here's, here's the 70 limit for EPA and New Hampshire. And here are the individual uh, PFOA and PFOS levels here. You can see they're very low compared to the 70, but also compared to the 40 that New Hampshire, that uh, New Jersey has established. And, the, and, and again, New Jersey, it only applies to the PFOA, so the darker bars. And Vermont also it only applies to the PFOA. So the drinking water that's in the distribution system that cu customers are receiving, the levels of those two regulated compounds are very low compared to the level of concern. And now we're going to talk about the <clears throat> levels of PFCs that we've found in the wells. So again, we've, uh, we've tested for the last four years, and uh, the range for uh, 2017 results for PFOA and PFOS in the wells has been undetected. So a couple of our bedrock wells, uh, we didn't detect any of the 14 compounds. Uh, and then uh, well six uh, had two detects in 2017 that were on the order of 25 parts per trillion. And that's the highest level we've detected for the two regulated compounds. For total PFCs, all 14 of them, again, none detect in uh, some of those Winnicott wells and even some of the Mill Road wells, uh, up to as high as 88 uh, total for the uh, 14 compounds in well number six. Can I ask a question? Intro, please. Can that go back to that. Just that, that previous slide, please. And I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so no. Exactly. 
right this there. One? Range 2017 total PFCs. You say that 88 represents five compounds they're testing for? 14. 14. Okay, thank you. But John, we're only, but not all 14 were detected. Right. So we detected, uh, I, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, a total of seven PFCs out of the 14 have been detected at all. There are seven that we have not detected in any sample. So it could be uh, seven or six or five. I, I don't have it in front of me, but seven, seven of the 14 have never been detected in any of our testing. Okay, so now, again, this is the water that's in the wells. And the main point of this graph is to show that for most of our wells, uh, the levels of the PFOA and PFOS are very low, individually less than five, most of them combined less than 10. But then we have two samples from well six here, uh, where the levels are on the order of 25 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS combined. So this stands out from the rest of these results. Something's going on here. And uh, these wells here, these are the Mill Road wells. And you can see something going on here, something going on here. Uh, so uh, we, we need to uh, look further into that and determine uh, it, it's apparent that there's a, uh, a source or sources of PFC contamination reaching the mill road wells, whereas the other wells are very, very low levels. Okay, so what are we doing about it? So there are three primary activities that we are taking in response to this uh, data that we have obtained from our monitoring. Uh, num action number one is uh, increasing uh, the level of our monitoring. So 14, 15, and 16 we monitor once in the year. Uh, in 17, uh, so far we have monitored three times. We have results for two of those three. Uh, but we have decided that we are going to, starting in September, uh, we're going to monitor for six months in a row at 14 points. So six of those points are in the distribution system so that we build up our database on what are the levels that the customers are actually receiving. And we're also going to do more monitoring of the uh, mill road wells and also well 5A in Rye. Uh, the reason for well 5A is because there's been uh, reports of uh, concerns about multiple landfills that might be impacting uh, 5A. We don't see high levels right now, but you know we want to make sure uh, that we're not impacted in the future. Uh, Mill Road, we're focusing on those for obvious reasons. That's where we're finding the highest levels uh, in our sources of supply. Uh, <clears throat> so those results uh, will be uh, shared with the town officials and also posted on our website. So right now, on our website, all of our test results are there. We have a, a list of frequently asked questions. And in the fourth question, there's a link to a table that has all of our test results, every sample that's been uh, uh, tested. And when we get the results back from the late August sampling, those uh, which we're expecting by the end of this week, uh, probably early next week, those will be uh, up on that website also. Okay, action number two is to investigate uh, groundwater contamination with PFCs at the Mill Road well field. So why? Because that's where the highest levels are. And here we are coordinating very closely with New Hampshire Department of uh, Environmental Services. Uh, so they're, you know, their health group and uh, Brandon Kernan is the lead there. Uh, I'm in contact with him every week. Uh, they have uh, begun monitoring of test wells on uh, properties uh, where there's potential for PFC contamination. And he's also uh, obtained samples from some private wells because PFCs can impact private wells as well as uh, public wells. Uh, so the monitoring has been gone, begun. We have also retained a hydrogeologist to help us uh, 
identify uh, potential additional uh, sources of contamination up, uh, aside from in addition to what uh, New Hampshire DES has already identified. Uh, and, and our hydrogeologist is in communication with uh, DES also. Uh, so the purpose here is to identify uh, sources of the current contamination, determine whether we need to put down additional monitoring wells. So these are small wells that we would uh, put in between our production wells and the uh, known sources of contamination and potential sources of contamination. And then we would sample them and have them tested and then review the results with the consultant and with New Hampshire DES and share them with uh, the uh, town leaders also. And that information uh, will help to identify where the contamination is coming from in the mill road uh, wells and then, you know, what can be done about that? Can it be abated? Uh, Action number three is similar to number two, but it applies to all of our wells. So we're going to take the same approach that we're doing with Mill Road. Mill Road's the most urgent because it has the highest levels, but we have these other well fields and other single wells, and we want to do an assessment of what the contamination risk for those wells are. Also, uh, the levels are low currently, but we want to get assurance uh, that we don't have a contamination plume heading for those wells. And if we do find a contamination plume, to work with DES uh, to uh, develop more information on it and then determine can, can that pollution be abated uh, before uh, it gets to our wells. And action number four is uh, we're doing a treatment evaluation for the mill road wells. So that involves looking at uh, the different types of treatment that are available. For example, granular activated carbon is one type of treatment that is known to uh, be able to remove PFCs. We're looking at a couple of other types of treatment also. And then we're, we're determining, uh, getting an assessment on uh, treating different combinations of the well. So do we just treat, if we just treat well six, uh, this is the impact, this is what's involved, this is the capital cost and the operating cost, all the way up to treating all of them together. And that information will be uh, presented to the town leaders. Uh, and we have uh, a preliminary assessment due in about two weeks from our uh, consultant and uh, should have a final uh, recommendation in about a month. For the alternatives analysis. The alternatives analysis, right. And that's my presentation. Questions? Do you have anything else to present or? No, we'd be glad to take any questions. Okay, let's start. Regina, do you? Um, yeah, I'd like to actually stem off what uh, Jim and Waddell said earlier. I was that we actually had a meeting this morning with all these officials from Aquarian, and I w I got to tell you, I feel a lot better after listening to your presentation today, and I probably feel even a little bit better now. And I'm very happy that you're going to work with us to be proactive on this, to make sure that, you know, we make sure that we have clean water, like we always had. And I just am really looking forward to working together, putting this all down. I think it's going to make a lot of people feel better. And can I get that presentation? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Rusty? I'm all set this time. Mr. Griffin. Um, excuse me. I'd like to know who does your testing? Our testing is done by Eastern Analytical Laboratory in New Hampshire. Well, we send the samples to them. They do not have the capability to perform PFC testing, so they sub the work out. In 2014 and 15, they sent it to a, uh, a laboratory approved by EPA for the, uh, the required testing, a lab in California. Uh, in 2016, they subbed it to a lab owned by the same company in Pennsylvania. 2017, uh, they have subbed it uh, to um, a, another lab in California, a different lab. 
Do you feel that this is something that the state should be doing? I understand the state doesn't have the, they would like to do this uh, in the uh, Department of Public Health or whatever, but they don't have the uh, manpower, it, you know, it's not funded. But would, that, would it make it better, would it be a better situation if the state was able to do this testing? Um, I'm really not qualified to answer that, but uh, I know that they are using some of the la same laboratories that we have used. Again, it's still early days in the laboratories and developing methods and producing results that are accurate. So uh, I think the labs that EPA approved to do the testing in 2014 and 15 kind of have a leg up on the other labs. They've been doing it longer. Uh, so I think uh, New Hampshire BES is doing the right thing. Um, I, I don't know, you know, what it would entail to get the expertise in-house, the equipment, mm -hmm. uh, in order to do it uh, in, at their own uh, facility. Yeah, so I was talking with someone at the state labs, and they said they have, they would have the ability to do this, but they just don't have the funding. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Aquarion. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to try and sound like the smartest guy in the uh, room on, on these issues because it's biologic. Uh, the uh, state of New Hampshire held uh, hearings with the Public Utilities Commission, and this is just for public uh, situational awareness. Regina was there. Uh, the delegation was there. Mr. Geraldo was there. Uh, Commissioner Bailey uh, asserted our right as uh, uh, interveners uh, and uh, as consumers that irrespective of who owns uh, uh, the, this water company, uh, and no matter what happens between Eversource and Aquarian, that we have direct access with PUC, uh, with the uh, Public Utilities Commission. Mr. Gerald can uh, back me up on this. He's nodding his head. That we can address uh, the issues that are, are of concern to us directly to the Public Utilities Commission. So while we are encouraged by Eversource's uh, 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 role, new role, and this uh, stock purchase um, that Hampton independently uh, is going to pursue what's in the best interest of uh, uh, the citizens and consumers of water. The granulated activated carbon, uh, uh, I would say, and again, not an expert, uh, there's um, the state of New Jersey. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, your remedies and, and potentialities going forward to treat it. They have, uh, they've already got that in my meetings with Eversource. Uh, July 1st, 2015, uh, they've uh, established those lower limits uh, that uh, are a fraction of what the Department of Environmental Service allows uh, for PFCs and PFOAs uh, for those carcinogens in our water. You showed those on your graph. Uh, so they're already there. And uh, our question, of course, in Hampton is uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, ascribe to those lower limits. And when you show a bar graph with a, a small limit on 70, uh, when, when you show that, that bar graph on, on Mill Road uh, and you tested um, uh, uh, and you had a reading of 88 and seven of those came out, well, you're halfway to the New Jersey maximum limit on some of these wells. And we don't think that's safe. I don't think it's safe. Uh, you are the, the, those, there's different ways to look at data, but if you take New Jersey's limit and you take those eight wells that showed nothing, or eight, eight tests they're showing, um, half the limit that's already in New Jersey. They've got granulated, uh, gran uh, the activated carbon. Uh, 2015, they've set those lower limits. So we're not relying uh, on uh, anybody but Tom Ballestero, our uh, uh, expert that we've hired. Uh, New Jersey has a whole committee, statewide committee set up for this. And they are now, um, 2015, we're into 18, three and four years ahead of Aquarium, head of the state of New Hampshire. And uh, th those are standards that um, uh, when you say uh, it's safe and they're minimal, I'm looking at the data a different way, and I say it's a, a perennial uh, and sudden onset of a challenge, and that uh, I, I wouldn't agree with your assertions uh, that it's a safe level uh, and it's, it's minimal compared to the limit. I think the limit established by the state of New Hampshire is too high. Uh, we should be uh, drinking water and have limits as equally as safe as New Jersey, and I've lived in New Jersey. 
uh, and they have a lot more contaminants down there, and they can get it safe. The GAC process, and we've talked about this uh, in Concord, we've talked about it in Boston with Eversource, uh, Mr. Walsh is nodding his head, it's not that expensive to implement, and we're looking for those capital expenditures um, going forward and uh, a more robust and aggressive, uh, while, we, while we we're happy with the partnership, but a more robust prevention, a more robust testing. And finally, uh, we've got the uh, Coakley Landfill Group. And uh, we spoke earlier, and, and, and get off the high horse here in just one second, Mr. Chairman, is that it is a united front. It's Aquarian. Aquarian didn't pollute this water. Eversource didn't pollute this water, so we welcome uh, Eversource's locality uh, and their, uh, uh, their juxtaposition of effort with Aquarian and your expertise in, in the utility to uh, um, bring this to a head. There was a 21 September meeting that uh, the Coakley Landfill Group, this will come up later on uh, in our meeting tonight, they're trying to hold that in, in private which I, I uh, and perhaps others on this board would say that's in violation of the state constitution, certainly not transparent when we have this alarming uh, unknown plume, as we called it, and you called it. So going forward, um, those are my concerns. Again, Mr. Gerald would uh, uh, equally back up uh, that we have direct, ac direct access, no matter how this merger goes out, and I'm sure it's going to go through uh, with this, the PUC, and we, we, of course, reserve that right, and we'll look for your hydrologist to work with Dr. Ballastaro, who we, we just reinforced him with some more um, pecuniary uh, assets uh, to his benefit to work with you folks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Do you folks have anything else, Mr. Drone? Um, one thing that wasn't mentioned in the presentation is that uh, despite the fact that the uh, in this emerging field, uh, the fact that the, the levels set so far by the EPA have not been met, nevertheless, Aquarian has shut down well six out of, out of an abundance of caution and I think good caution. Um, we have alerted them this morning, as Mr. Bean has just indicated, to the fact of this meeting on September 21. And uh, I want to let the board know this is a meeting of the Coakley Landfill Group. Coakley is probably the nearest source that has is an identified uh, potential source of PFCs. Now that's to the north and west of, of, of this well field that is showing these levels. And so far that has not been uh, studied whether or not there is flow coming in this direction. What is needed are the kind of monitoring wells in it to find out if that is the source. And uh, Aquarian is proposing to put, put some of those in at their expense, but nevertheless, it should be the responsibility of the Coakley Landfill Group, which is the, uh, the uh, potentially responsible party group that is in charge, has been in, put in charge by EPA as of the Superfund site to do those explorations at their expense. And that is what we are urging uh, the EPA and the, and the DES to do. Um, nevertheless, if this meeting is conducted in a non-public session, the public will not know what EPA is requiring. And uh, I, I agree 100 percent with um, Selectman Bean that this is something that we should, uh, we should, should be conducted in public, as was the last Coakley Landfill session group session that was held in Northampton in uh, mid-August. And so when it comes time to discuss that at, the, at that point, or we can do it at this point, I'm suggesting to the board, and I've written the EPA and uh, DES and suggested to them that we strongly uh, want this meeting to be conducted in public in the Seacoast area where the public can see what is going on and have a meaningful insight to what's going on. And, uh, and aren't we going to discuss that later? Aren't we going to bring up something later on that? We, just... we can, but I've, I've all, we have also urged Aquarian in the meeting this morning to join with us in urging that this meeting be a public meeting. Okay. Uh, with respect to this meeting, we we believe in uh, all parties sharing information. Uh, we surely will share information with folks. It's what our action three is all about. And we list stakeholders, stakeholders up there, Coakley Landfill Group is one of the stakeholders uh, and we uh, would like to know uh, definitely would like to know the results of this meeting um, and I would uh, 
I would assume that that information would be shared with all of us um, once that meeting is convened. I have a question. Have you ever known in Aquarian Water Company at all, total company, have you ever had a polluter that you found out about? Uh, John, do you know? Yes, yes. Uh, down in Connecticut, we, we've had, you know, in the mid-1980s, no one heard about PFCs, but the big thing was leaking underground storage tanks. Uh, leaking underground storage tanks, so gasoline tanks. So we had a, a well field in Salisbury that uh, uh, showed some gasoline hydrocarbons, and so we did a similar thing. Uh, we worked with the state, and we... Uh, put in some monitor wells and we determined that uh, gasoline was coming from two gas stations. There were tanks in the ground that they weren't even aware of that, that still contained some gasoline. So they pulled those tanks out and we are still monitoring those 30 years later. We're still monitoring our monitor wells to detect where the plume is at this year. And as far, did you have to treat for that? to? Get it. We ended up not having to treat for it uh, because the, the, the traces that we found initially in one of the monitor wells went away. But the threat is still there. Yeah, I would say this, Mr. Chairman, I really want to drill down on this, and I'm, I'm looking for uh, an enthusiastic support on this. There's uh, a Seacoast Media Group uh, article on this, and uh, Attorney Sullivan, I'm going I'm to be, um, and we can incorporate this into the motion later on so we don't have to repeat it. Uh, September 21st is going to be an EPA DES meeting. City Attorney Bob Sullivan, who serves as the CLG's Executive Committee. Now, he's the attorney for Portsmouth, City of Portsmouth, okay? Subsequent, this is Mr. Sullivan, subsequent to that meeting, okay, we would propose, now their water's not imperiled, ours is, perhaps. We would pro propose that we provide an update of Coakley activities to the city council in public session. So he's going to talk, uh, as the city town manager, or the city attorney, to the city of Portsmouth in public session about stuff that perhaps is affecting our water. And, and people don't say there's a conflict of interest. People say that we want to you know, hear what's going on at this closed meeting, which we will uh, protest. Um, and then we're talking about Mr. Murphy from the EPA. He's the spokesperson. I don't know what his, his pedigree is. Uh, but he says uh, that's a pretty in-depth in investigation. It usually takes a couple of years. This is a current article just prior to this. And this should concern you because water is your product. Um, and, and just going on. Um, the, suspend, the Superfund Record of Decision on Management of Migration in Coakley did provide a cost analysis for four source control alternatives, including the natural attenuation that was chosen. That was the cheapest method that they could possibly get away with. And in $1993, it was a measly 2 to $3 million. And it was chosen, and now we're still 30 years later facing this problem. During an interview Tuesday, Sullivan, Sullivan acknowledged any request for CLG to install a pump and treat system, which may be what we need more quickly than not, would be a significant and expensive proposition. So this is public information that's out there. It's ominous. Uh, it is one-sided. It is strictly serving the interests of Portsmouth. There's no mention of Hampton. Um, we have a letter out to the uh, town attorney uh, in, in Portsmouth who serves as the CLG. It is the uh, prisons in charge of the, uh, the uh, cell keeping over there. And uh, I would ask um, that, that we hear from all of you tonight at Aquarian, uh, on behalf of Eversource going forward, that you support us in uh, opposing that meeting being private, that uh, if we uh, pursue any legal actions to uh, uh, open up that meeting, that you join us in that. It's our water. It's your company. You've done nothing to do it. And if I were an Aquarian executive, I would feel very concerned about people polluting my product, perhaps. It's talking about taking two years with the EPA spokesman and we don't need to hear about spokesmen. We need science and we need our data. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a response, Mr. Chairman, from you folks uh, that you will enthusiastically support that that meeting be public and you support any efforts of your customers to drink your water, uh, that this 21 September meeting uh, be held in public and support our legal efforts to do so. I think having just heard about this meeting this morning, um, you know, not knowing the goal or agenda of the meeting. My understanding is EPA, New Hampshire DES, and the Coakley Landfill Group are going to be at that meeting. I don't know the other if there's any other parties. As I said, we don't know. I don't know the goals for that meeting. I don't know the agenda for that meeting. 
Um, I'm presuming it's a some sort of technical session. Um, so without knowing that, um, I don't. Um, what I can say is we want to know the results of that uh, meeting, the outcome for that meeting. We would expect that there would at least be uh, a continuation of the public meetings that have happened recently with the Coakley Landfill Group, and that the information from this proposed September 21st meeting would be shared at a, at a public meeting. Uh, but I think without knowing uh, the specific goals and the agenda for that meeting, um, uh, I, um, I don't know that I can support it as enthusiastically as uh, Selectman Bean is requesting. Okay, and, um, and just to follow on and, sure. and got that, and I'm not going to press you on it, John, but uh, it's the uh, EPA that says this is going to take a couple of years, okay, a couple of years uh, from a 30-year-old problem with an unknown plume perhaps heading towards our wells and we've shut one down. Um, and, and let me quote, unless Mr. Attorney Robert Sullivan, who is the uh, head of the CLG, uh, he, he's going to be with the EPA the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, the EPA says this is a couple of year issue. They've taken the shortest and cheapest way out of this 30 years ago. Uh, and the uh, Department of Environmental Service has limits that uh, are, are uh, hugely exponential compared to uh, what I just read you from uh, what the state of New Jersey has. And then what Mr. Sullivan is quoted as saying is he expects with the DES and the EPA, which we're not satisfied with, uh, their standards or their uh, timetables, that he expects sub substantive discussions with agencies, those two agencies, concerning an expansion of group responsibilities related to emerging contaminants such as PFCs. Now that's just that's just legalese, you know. And and you guys by by third party, maybe an email, um, maybe a telephone call, and uh, get the information. And uh, I will tell you that it's it's not a standard that we're going to accept. And we're going to we're going to discuss it later on tonight. But I, I would think that um, you folks would join us. Uh, and again, I'm not going to pin you down, but it's ominous and it's threatening, and uh, we're taking it very seriously. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Skip Webb from the advisory board had requested to speak. Is that all right with you? It's your appointment. Yes. 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 Okay. Skip, can you keep it quick? <laughs> keep it quick. Please. Skip Webb, 28, Seabury. Well, Aquarian Water contacted me a week ago asking if I would speak on their behalf. I had the meetings with them that several of you have had, and I was of the benefit of getting some of your input given to me at that meeting. I think of the selectmen and the water company deserve to be complimented on the way that they have worked to protect our water supply. This is a complicated issue and one of the things that uh, wasn't brought out I think in the uh, presentation was that the increase in well six is a spiking. It's something that happened recently. It's not something that has materialized over a period of time. So this means that it might be something that's permanent or it might be something that is temporary. The testing that's been put into place will tell us that. But I think it reduces the concern to the public if they know that it might be just a temporary spike. During that meeting, I took a different approach. They were telling me, we're testing these wells, we're going to add these other surface wells so that we can test them to see how the PFCs are progressing in the area. I took the approach, what has happened that have, might have caused an increase of PFCs in our local well? Here we have a 
Hampton. The second to the closest well to Hampton. It is in a large aquifer that the well in Hamptons draws from also. The aquifer goes from the borderline North Hampton up to under Route 1, under the center of town, down to the edge of our own landfill. So what has happened in that area that might have caused some changes? We, two years ago, or three years ago, uh, Fred Welsh could confirm when, it doesn't have to, but we did a uh, large change of groundwater flow, uh, putting in pipes and hoping some residents on Mill Road because of the fact that they uh, were flooding. Uh, that might have changed the flow from Route 1 over to where these wells are. Another one is on White's Road and the conservation property off of it. And for years we tried to say we shouldn't be building on that property and then on the edge of it uh, they asked if they could put in a subdivision. And that subdivision the water company did research and said that really won't affect the well that much. But that's a change that could have affected the flow of water into that well. The other are the businesses along Route 1. Uh, what do we have? We have a couple of closed gas stations. Those could be giving us a problem. And then we have our own landfill. The aquifer goes up and touches the water side of that landfill. So that whole landfill is very close to the area that could be polluting our water supply. There has been no evidence that it has been. And because of the fact that the well in Hampton isn't showing the increase in PFCs, that particular possibility is actually very low. Skip, I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to hold you to the three minutes of public comment. It's the same thing as public comment, what you're doing. So if you can kind of wrap it up, please. OK. Um, so I have uh, the water company has said that they will also look at those locations and try to, uh, in their determination as to where the PFCs are coming from. And I'm, thank you. Thank, thank you, Skip, very much. Yeah, thank you very much. You had a question? I did. I want to say, I want to say something that we talked about upstairs. Aquarian um, is prepared. Is, Aquarian is going to be testing everything. And they have a plan in place. They showed us the beginnings of a map they put together. And I am confident that they will do what they need to do. Like Mr. Bean says, no level is safe, but seven looks better to me than 23. I don't want any. I'm sure none of us want any. But they have put procedures in place, like they said it's in the infancy. But I have confidence that they are going to do what we need them to do as our water company, our water provider. Okay, Skip, thank you. Because just well, as like public comment, we're not going to go back and, and forth. Is, with um, my concerns are the same as what those yep. are that Phil Bean mentioned. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Skip. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming in. We appreciate it. We appreciate the much. effort, and uh, let's keep it going forward, all right? Let's keep everything transparent and working together. Thank you. Right. Town manager report. You still go? What? Did I miss something? Yep. Ah, Brian Provincial. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
at discussion of the petition 2012 Warren Article 35. I just want to say on this on this appointment, this was a very well discussed issue at one of our meetings. So it wasn't something that came up. Just, it was well discussed. I'm sorry, at, at a meeting because there was a hot dispute between a couple of I think myself and Ms. Barnes on whether we were going to do it or not. Right. Uh, so it was it was discussed for a, a good lengthy time at the meeting. Uh, we will try to make sure that things are evident on the agenda going forward, but it, it was well discussed. Mm -hmm. Have a, uh, you can either speak up there or have a seat. Either one. Wait, I'll sit here. Um, I just I didn't really want to get into what the discussion was or the issues with the other things that were going on with this. I just wanted to speak to the Warren article that I put through. And just some of the errors that I feel that are were made on the new one when they amended it in 2014. Um, it's actually 149-15. Uh, the one that I put forth was 148. And when they amended it, it moved over to 149, which is why I had a hard time finding where it was before. I was confused where it went. Um, <clears throat> the decibel readings I had was 80 until midnight. And then after midnight is when I had changed it originally. And then it was amended at that selectman's meeting to go till 1 a.m., which wasn't my intent when they first did it. Because I went around and I did readings on the beach. And the reason I picked 80 is because that's what the ambient sound is. If you're not in front of a business and you're standing somewhere, it's 80. So that's where I came up with the 80 decibels. And then I think it dropped to, I don't remember, it was 70 or something like that. Because after midnight is when it actually drops off. It doesn't drop off at 11. Things are still going pretty good around them. So when this was amended to 75 decibels, the ambient sound is 77 to 80. That's why I came up with that. It's an unenforceable ordinance. It's not going to work for anybody. If you want it to be quieter, you can't. There's just the people talking, the cars going by, and the activities that's taking place. That's the level that they're at. There was people that were not in the business seasonal zone at the time that contested my warrant article that was passed and put through that was never put actually into the town law. They wanted it to be 50. 50 is, is all well and good, but you can't have 50. If anybody wanted 50, you, you can't. You could can say it has to be 50, and that's what we're stuck with right now. We have a noise ordinance that's 75, and then at 11 it goes to 50. I also had put it 50 feet from the property line. Because some of the things we have, I heard people talking about is where to where to measure from, and if it's someone over here complaining, do you measure from here or there? You measure 50 feet from the business, and you stand there and you hold your take a reading. If you're over the 80 decibels, then you're obviously in violation because the ambient sound is 80. It's between 77 and 80. So by changing it to 75, it's already lower than it's going to be on the street. So everybody is going to be in violation. And then at 50 decibels at 11 p.m. is unobtainable because it's not 50 decibels anywhere on Hampton Beach, on the Strip, in the business seasonal zone. Someone that's in an RB zone that surrounds it may want 50. If they're a direct butter, it's not going to be 50. It's going to be above that, and you go a couple rows back into the buff into that zone, and then you'll start achieving those levels of 50. But I think it'll be around 60, honestly. So. Those are just some things that were amended in 2014 from mine in 2012 that nobody did a study. I actually went around. I've worked at 12 different restaurants, bars on Hampton Beach as a DJ. I'm familiar with the beach. I know how loud everything is down there. I went around and I did studies. There's people that say, I don't, 80 is too loud. That's too loud. And they just look at what 80 decibels is. They haven't gone out with a reader and sat there for a night. In, in between two businesses where there is no business to see what the reading is. And that's what it is. It's between 77 and 80. So to put it any lower or to change it at 11 o'clock, it's unobtainable and nobody's going to be able to enforce it and it's just going to be an argument for everybody. So, questions? Yes. So how do you think, I, the reason why I, I was my idea to have him in as an appointment, just because I knew that he did have gone and done this study. Do you think I would like to maybe see something like this occur again with Bernie's there, with the way the beach is conditioned right now. I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter who, where, what place you're in front of or where you are, that's what the ambient sound is there. And if you're creating a business and you're, the ambient sound goes over that, then you're, you're in a violation. You need to get a baseline for the beach of what it is. And that's where I came up with 80 because 
that was basically the ballpark of where it is. So if you're standing in front of the casino and it's 90, or you're standing in front of the boardwalk and it's 90, then you know you're above what the surrounding area is, then you'd be creating a disturbance to everybody. And that's where I came up with the number of 80. And the, the opposition that didn't like that were people that were in the RB zone that didn't, they wanted it to be 50. And it can't be 50. Just the amount of traffic, the people, and everybody down there, it's unobtainable, it's unenforceable, and it doesn't work. So that's where, that's where I came up with the 80 at midnight. And at midnight is when it actually starts to slow down. People get to where they're going around 10, 30, 11 at night. So to start closing, to saying, oh, late nights, uh, I don't know, 11 o'clock, it's not going to work. You can't make it 11. You can't make it 50. Those two things can't happen because they won't happen. So I think that when we get prepared to review the ordinance for, you know, the 2018 town meeting, that we need to consider everyone, whoever wants to give input, public comment, have appointments, we need to consider what we want down there. Because in my opinion, and I think that Brian Provencial, he's also the vice chairman that sits on the zoning board and uh, is very familiar with all the zones and all of the town, should be a part of this with, I'm not sure, whoever else the board thinks is acceptable. And we need to figure out what we want down for the beach and how we can make it so that the same rules apply for everyone. But I mean, like, it's, like I said, like he says, I mean, you can't just pick a number because that's what someone wants. And like he's saying, if the ambient noise down there is 77 to 80, and our ordinance doesn't even reach that. And I don't believe in your ordinance, it wasn't distinguished between inside, outside. It was 50 no, feet from the No, what business. I had done is I had tried to make it blanket. If you have somebody outside or you have somebody inside, you can't violate the noise ordinance no matter what it is. So it was cut and dry, so there was nobody saying, because. I think it was 1159 or something for outside entertainment, but if you're not violating it, that was it. Mr. Bartle, do you have any questions? No, at this time. Mr. Griffin. Yeah, I don't think anyone's going to, you know, with all due respect to Brian, I don't think anyone's going to be comfortable with the fact that he has worked as a DJ at Wally's. He's worked as a contractor for Mr. Flurry. But I've worked at... You've okay. worked at plenty of places. I've worked You've at the boardwalk. Board 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 he's okay. speaking when I come back to the place. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to be comfortable with him being part of any uh, group that decides this. Okay. That's thing, how I feel about yeah, it. I, 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 and I feel like we're showing favoritism okay. by even having wait, him wait, wait. here tonight. Wait, wait. I think this is a mistake, and I've never seen anyone else that wrote a Warren article and have it voted okay. on, come in here and discuss it like this, I think it's wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay, we, we decided to have him in with an appointment now. Hold on, yeah, hold I on. I think it was a mistake okay. on your part. Okay, thank you. But we're we're, we're going to do, Big hang mistake. on. No, I just want hey, to. Would you let, let me right, finish, okay. please? Yes. You could, zoning board, you hold people, you know, let's, no, let's do no. a meeting yeah. here. Uh, what we're going to do, we've not decided how we're going to how we're going to do this with the article yet. We've not come up with anything. We've not come up with who's going to be on a committee or whether it's going to be a committee, whether it's going to be a group of experts and what it's going to be. So that's still in the decision process. All right, that's still in the decision process. I'm under the impression that we're not having a committee. That's what I've. Been uh, we have not. Over there has not again. been. There's, I didn't there has been. To, to, yeah. There has been discussions, but there has not been well, anything it decided. Has been decided, but that's it. Has the way not it's been decided. I can guarantee I you that. Mr. Bean, do you have anything to add to this? Negative, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Me. What I'm going to do is we're just rehashing old stuff right now. No, but that's, I just. And other people like, aren't given their chance to talk. I agree with Ms. And what? this was a mistake tonight. Okay. I didn't want to talk about the committee. I just wanted to clear up that originally when I wrote it. I just wanted to clear up what you had it done. Was, Mr. You know, Griffin, could you please control yourself? I didn't want to speak to the committee. I told you I didn't. Yep. I own my own business down there. Yep. I don't work for okay. anybody else. Well, I work. Um, thank you for work. coming in, okay. and we're gonna we're gonna cut it off now. Thank you. Right. Can we go to the town manager's report, please. I wonder the minutes for us. Oh, let's do the minutes. <laughs> I'm so weekend. All right, minutes of August 21st, 2017. Move them. Second. All in favor? Unanimous. Minutes of August 28th, 2017. So moved. Second. All in favor? I'll abstain. Okay, you weren't here. Uh, town manager Sorry. report now. <laughs> keep rushing you. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Don't worry about it. All right. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, 
With regards to the June 6th communication to Commissioner Dredd regarding a request for funds for ambulance services at the Hampton Beach State Park, his reply communication of July 27th, that's almost two months later, indicated that he anticipated a reply to the end of August. This is just a report that I have not as yet, as of this date, received his reply. Uh, the State Department of Transportation, our Executive Counselor, and the Regional Planning Commission will be holding a public hearing on the State 10-Year Transportation Plan on Monday, October 16th at 7 p.m. at the Seashell Complex Oceanfront Pavilion Room at Hampton Beach State Park. That's open to the public for anyone who wishes to go and comment. Public Works has announced that uh, street center and fog lines will be painted on the night of September 13th as well as some crosswalks at various locations, weather permitting, of course. Paving activities will commence on Drake Side Road with milling and grinding of the surface, existing surface on September 20th, weather permitting. Academy Avenue has been posted for no parking on the west side, as previously ordered by the board. School bus loading and unloading during the day will occur on the street. To avoid long delays during loading and unloading period, it is suggested that you find alternate routes. And uh, I went up and checked it myself the other day, and um, unloading times with bringing students over from the other school uh, to have lunch at the, uh, at the middle school, um, you can plan on being there for about 10 to 15 minutes as they unload the buses. So it can be a long delay with the lights flashing on the buses. So. We, we suggest you, you, you just don't use that street if it's possible. There are a few other things, Mr. Chairman. Courthouse construction. The state has filed an application of the statute to allow the selectmen or the planning board to hold a meeting to present the plans. I suggest the planning board hold the meeting as, uh, as they intend to, to hear it during the time period. Uh, which is which expires Oct October 6th. Uh, there will probably be a PRC meeting to discuss the plan with town departments sometimes afterwards. So I would suggest a motion that the Board of Selectmen determine that they will not hold a hearing on the new courthouse construction, but will refer the matter to the planning board. So moved. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Gregside Road is going to be closed uh, from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Tuesday, September 12th, 2017. They're going to have to put a line across the street uh, at the Easterly High, High the Driveway at Hampton Meadows. Uh, please be aware of this plan. The road will be posted, but the road will be closed to through traffic on that day at those times. And just so you know, this, this past town meeting, we had appropriated funds to start the process of doing um, traffic signal um, cameras on the various traffic locations around town. The first one is Stickney Terrace at Lafayette Road, and that will be installed soon. The prices that was in the budget was $17,880. That's going to save us from having to dig up Route 1 to replace the wires that are underneath it. So that's going to be commenced sometime in the near future. No excavation of the street. That's it, sir. Anything else? No, sir. That's it. That's Very it. Very good. Ms. Barnes. Nothing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Bartle. All set. Thank you. Mr. Griffin. Mr. Bean. Negative, sir. Thank you. I did have a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just, I would like to agree with you that Academy Road is so easy to get a, a different route that people should just avoid Academy Road because the, there's so much going on down there right now that, and there are so many other different routes you can go to get where you're going. And it's not a major throughway, so it's best to do that. So thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, old business, Hampton Exeter Sewer Agreement revised. Mr. Chairman, the board had authorized me to do a draft, which I have previously submitted to the board for your review uh, of the new Exeter uh, Hampton Intergovernmental Agreement for the disposal of sewage for Roberts Drive and Warner Lane areas of the town between Hampton and Exeter. Uh, with your permission, gentlemen, I've heard no comments back on it. It's basically regurgitated the other agreement with updated information 
Uh, with your permission, I would send this over to the town of Exeter and have the selectmen review it there to see if they're in agreement with it. And then we can think about voting on it. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? So moved. Thank you, sir. Uh, but up, um, amb ambulance services costs for Hampton Beach State property. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, do you prefer Mr. Wells lead off on this? And uh, uh, we've all been driving this, but um, however you please. But you want to lead off on this? I'd be happy to, no. sir. Uh, we went through this, and uh, based on GASPI standards, uh, we actually had the fire department uh, review all the calls they had received for Hampton Beach, uh, both for fire and ambulance services, and then we had them review all the calls to all state property in the town of Hampton for ambulance and fire service. We also had them compute uh, all the costs of having firefighters go. That includes the health insurance, workers' comp, life insurance, taxes in the New Hampshire retirement system, ambulance depreciation, engine depreciation, all the factors that we, we, we put into the budget for those individual calls. The bottom line uh, the, the master bottom line was $731,787.17. That encompasses the years 14, 15, 16, and 17. So could you get that figure one more time, please? $731,787.17. It's a lot of money. A lot of money. I would say this, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, again, uh, this, uh, and, and just a, a, a quick perusal, is in violation of the state of New Hampshire Constitution regarding mandated programs. Every single year is our cost increase. Every single year is our overtime uh, exigency uh, dwarfs and, and challenges our leadership and our, and our firemen. Uh, and for, for tired uh, responders, uh, uh, creates a uh, uh, a scenario for injury um, that every year, every increasing incremental cost is a new uh, um, burden that is foisted upon us. It is not written in the RSA that governed the uh, uh, statutory transfer of title of the beach to uh, the state by the town of Hampton in 1933. There is no legal basis for us to provide this services. This is $165,000 a year, every year. It's growing. It's going to continue to grow. We have had uh, discussions, both I have as a rep, I've had them with the governor and asked for the uh, um, uh, removal of uh, the Dread Commissioner and the State Parks Director for this very same reason. We have sent a letter under your, your leadership, Mr. Chairman. We were told we would receive a response at the end of August. It is now approaching October. We don't get the courtesy of a response. This now should move to the uh, legal arena. I would like it, uh, Mr. Chairman, if uh, you agree and the board does, that Mr. Uh, Gerald is the uh, town esquire who's prepared a motion could uh, lead a way forward and propose a motion for us to seek legal remedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've been focusing ever since I've arrived here on the fact that in a number of areas, the state of New Hampshire and we have disputes concerning uh, responsibilities at Hampton Beach. Um, with reference to the 1933 session law that Mr. Bean just mentioned, um, I believe that uh, these should be tackled as a package. Um, it not only bears upon Article 28 of the state constitution, as Mr. Bean has mentioned, but also on the Equal Protection Clause of the New Hampshire Constitution, which indicates that equality of benefit is no less required than equality of burden. And uh, we, uh, the, the town of Hampton, uh, provides services that enables the state of New Hampshire to make a, a, some of the largest revenue in the entire state uh, through parking revenues at the beach. 
Uh, we provide the state of New Hampshire through our infrastructure the opportunity to earn rooms and meals taxes, of which we only earn a small proportion based on our year-round population, which is in no relation to the burdens that we bear. Uh, I believe that uh, there are a number of aspects that are involved in our relationship and uh, that, that need redress, uh, this being just one of them. And so I would, uh, the thing of that is, if you take on one subject in, in, in a court action without taking on the rest, you're precluded at a later time if it goes to judgment from doing that. So I would, I would suggest to the board that the whole picture be taken on, and therefore I uh, have prepared a motion uh, the town council is hereby authorized to initiate a declaratory judgment action in the state courts of the state of New Hampshire to obtain an adjudication of any and all aspects that are in dispute as to the responsibility for state property in the town of Hampton and for services in connection with the use or maintenance of said property and for entitlement to revenues that are generated at Hampton Beach that the state of New Hampshire is now retaining. Can I ask a question? Uh, let's open the questions. We'll start with Mr. Griffin. Um, does this include the sidewalks and the roads and drains? Yes, sir. It certainly yeah, does. Because that, I'm, I think it's time to do it. I, it's, we've waited far too long, and it's time to do something. Agreed. We're going to hold you last, all right? Not that you're wordy. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for it. I don't have any questions. Support. Well, I'm going to go before you, all right? Do you mind? Uh, you're the chair, all Mr. Right. Chairman. What do other towns, what, what, what happens in other areas where there's state parks? Now, I'm not talking about the drains and all that. I'm talking about services provided by police, fire, et cetera, public safety. What happens in other towns where there, other, in New Hampshire where there are state parks? Do the towns respond? And did they get reimbursed or not? Not to my knowledge, but we'll certainly explore that. I mean, I think everything should be explored. Mm -hmm. And and what my my what what is this going to cost us? Well, certainly, any time that my office is authorized to do something, we do explore these things first, to be sure, and to to put forth all reasonable grounds for these matters. Uh, obviously, this is a major. This is a major initiative, and it, we've had a major problem for many years. The roads, the drainage, uh, Ocean Boulevard, uh, they've been plaguing us for years and uh, without a resolution. That gets visited on us every day. Someone gets hurt down at the beach on Ocean Boulevard. They step in a hole in Ocean Boulevard. The state says, talk to the town. It's not our road. And so the people who are hurt uh, are, have a tough time figuring out against whom there's redress. And one of these days it needs to be resolved, the responsibility. And this is the time. Certainly there's a lot of costs, but one of the advantages you have from having in-house counsel is that uh, you're not spending the 300 to $400 an hour that you might spend for that outside firm. Uh, the cost of my time is approximately $95 to $100 per, an hour, per hour. Okay. I'll. I'll Go to Mr. Bean's questions, and then I'll reserve to come back to everybody before we do anything. Uh, okay. I, I would uh, move uh, council's motion. I'm looking for a second. I'll second. I'll second that. Okay, discussion on the motion. No discussion. Uh, I would. I would really like to say. I mean, I, I totally agree with everybody, but I totally don't want to jump into something that we're not prepared to jump into. That we're that we're not well prepared with and going forward, that we don't know what, how it's dealt with in other areas of the state. I'm not saying we have to follow them, but I, you know, I, don't want, I don't want to create a huge problem that then we have the probability of, of winning very small. That's, that's, my, that's my only issue with it, that I, I want to make sure that all our homework has been done, that we're well aware of what we're going to do, that we, that we have a plan to move forward, a plan to A, B, C, D. I always like extra plans. I don't like to go in just foolhearted, just jump into something and say, we'll do this today, and then all of a sudden say, and we kind of didn't look into that enough. That's my feeling. The way I look at it is we're out 
We spent money, we've got nothing back. I say we try to get it back. We, we provided a service for people who were in Hampton, and we provided a service for anybody that, I mean, I'm not talking about the parking, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about the police and the fire and the ambulances. We're going to provide a service for people. Now, I agree, they're in our town. That, that's my feeling. They're in our town. They're on st state property, maybe, but they're in our town. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, I would uh, uh, respectfully request for a vote. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? I would like to say, too, that... Um, we just voted. Yeah, I would no, like that, to that say... That issue's closed. We, we, we voted. He well, called for a vote. I would vote. like to comment I'm, on it. Well, it's full. It's okay. finished. You always moving. control everything, don't you? Well, I'm the chairman. Okay. Thank yeah. you. We, 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 Conflict of interest letter regarding Portsmouth best. City Attorney Robert Sullivan, Coakley Landfill Group Leadership. Uh, do you want to take the lead on this? You're, you've been pretty vocal. Uh, I'm happy to, yes. uh, and uh, I, I don't, in, in the interest of uh, uh, not being over-redundant, uh, the uh, uh, letter has been sent uh, with the unanimous uh, uh, consent and vote of the board. Uh, the letter, uh, the uh, Seacoast Media Group Online um, uh, uh, article that I just read, I don't need to read that again, uh, major concerns. Uh, the town esquire additionally has a uh, motion prepared for that, and I would uh, defer to him, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Want to give that? Um, well, in, as in uh, following the direction of the board to uh, prepare this letter that did go out, I uh, necessarily had to learn a lot about the Coakley Landfill Group, how they run, uh, what their function is under the consent decree that was developed by the uh, EPA. DES in the federal court, and uh, it is a fact that the Coakley Landfill Group uh, is essentially in charge of the site and its and its remedial uh, efforts, uh, as guided by EPA and DES. And uh, what I have learned is that there is, uh, so far, there has not been much effort to ascertain. <coughs> what is flowing from Coakley in the southerly direction. In other words, in the direction of these very wells that were talked about tonight. But are we talking about the conflict of interest? No. I'm talking about now something else. Are you talking about the conflict of interest? Uh, Maybe uh, I'm confused. Well, I, I, I touched on that briefly and then referred to the motion to authorize the pleadings to uh, open those proceedings publicly on 21 September. Correct. Yes. I was intending to bring that. I tried to bring that okay, up. Okay. Hold, hold on one second. Okay. Under number three here, we had conflict of interest letter regarding Portsmouth attorney Robert Sullivan. Did we skip, we didn't skip? I, I, I no, touched on that. The letter's been the letter's been sent. Been sent. Okay, been sent. And we're all we set expect, there. We expect all right. a response. So now we're on to that motion. Fine. So, okay. I'm sorry. So now, so now, what, what I, as I mentioned in the uh, presentation by Aquarian, uh, there hasn't been much effort on the part of the Coakley Landfill Group to uh, to study. Uh, what is happening from its site going to the south. Uh, that is a known source of PFCs. Whether that source is the contributor or not to the Aquarian wells is unknown, but nevertheless needs to be studied because there are not many identified sources of PFCs in this area. And so uh, this, is, this is something that has come up uh, very recently with EPA, DES, and the Coakley Landfill Group, and decisions are going to be made about what level of effort is going to be made to investigate and monitor that southerly flow. Uh, Aquarian, from our meeting today, has some ideas of what should be done in order to do that, not at their expense, but at the expense of the Coakley Landfill Group. But if the public is not aware of what's being decided there, we're at a, at a decided disadvantage. Right. So the motion is? That's town council. Uh, by the way, on, on Friday, last Friday, I sent to EPA and DES, uh, copying the Coakley Landfill yep. Group, uh, copies of these Aquarian results because they, uh, 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 the Coakley Landfill Group didn't necessarily have those results. But now they do. Okay. 
that have that same map that shows the location of wells. Don't want to rush you, but what's the motion? Motion is town council is hereby authorized to initiate such proceedings in the United States District Court for the District of New Hampshire as are necessary to ensure that meetings of EPA, DES, and the Coakley Landfill Group are open to the public and are conducted at a location in the seacoast area of New Hampshire. I'll make it. Second. Okay. I, I agree 100%. Any other discussion, first of all? No? Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. It's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And Thank I expect to hear back from uh, I've asked uh, EPA to get back in touch with yep. me tomorrow about their intentions. New business. I think any, excuse me, anybody else have old business? No. no? Okay. New business. No. 2000 annual report. You want to take that? 2017 annual <laughs> report. <laughs> what did I say? 2000. 2000. <laughs> Go back in time. We could go back in time. I'd, I'd like to be a little younger at times. <laughs> I'm, I'm extremely tired. Uh, shoot. We, we'd like to have a, a waiver of the purchasing policy, Mr. Chairman. Uh, section 718-3A1 and 718-4A1 through 4 and award the uh, continued printing to the country press for printing. I'll make that motion. Second. And the reason that that's the one we always use, right? It's the one we always use. We bid every year, and every year we can't find anybody that comes even close to them. And they do an excellent job. And they provide job. in lots of extra job. services yeah. for us. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? None? Uh, closing comments? I have a closing comment. Okay, go ahead. I would like to say that, in my opinion, that uh, whatever happens when Mr. Gerald does take on the state if it doesn't work for the uh, the taxpayers have nothing to lose because they're being they're being uh, they're losing all the time now because what the state won't do the town won't do either and the people who live on Ocean Boulevard like I do pay their taxes and they get nothing anybody else the closing comment um, mr. chairman yes uh, while in public session uh, I would I would ask the board to a motion to go into a non-public session under RSA 91 hyphen capital A colon 3 Roman 2 small a uh, personnel uh, Rome, uh, small c uh, reputation and small e consideration or negotiation of pending claims or litigation so moved but before we do that <laughs> <laughs> All right, I like to say something. It was my idea to have Brian Provencial in tonight. Why? Because he has lived in this town his whole life. He has worked in businesses down that beach. He owns a business down that beach, and he is an elected okay, Regina, official of this Regina, town. Regina. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you can put the blame closing on me. Comments. All right. So I, I suggest this. Move. I made I made the motion. Second. All in favor. Aye. And a uh, roll call. Roll call. Aye. Regina. Aye. Rusty. Dean, Griffin, myself, yes. Thank you very much, public, for being here tonight. Thank you, Channel 22.